Um, good morning. I'm Richard Quartz. I'm a member of the uh, alumni board here at uh, the Terry College, and I'm uh, the chairman of the Terry Third Thursday Speaker Series. And uh, I want to start, as always, by recognizing our uh, co-sponsors, the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Uh, Bill Chandler and, and Jenny uh, Munsell are here with us this morning. Thank you. And uh, if, if y'all could stand real quick. And then always uh, with Public Broadcasting Atlanta, we have uh, Harriet Hoskins Aberhall. I believe Harriet might have a quick uh, announcement for us. Good morning, everybody. I should draw your attention, especially since there's so many Brits in the room, to a, a headline in the, British, uh, in the Atlanta Business Chronicle saying, British pub phenomenon crawls into town. Actually, they've been around for a long time. It's just a spotted dog in the old fire station in Midtown that's new. I do recommend it. It's a lovely spot. Noisy, but what do you expect? <laughs> um, not much business news from WABE this morning, but uh, a reminder that next month is Asian American slash Pacific Rim Heritage Month. So our television station, PBA TV 30, will be having a number of specials. Uh, we're heavily loaded towards Japan this year, so have you, if you have interest in Japan, um, I think there are at least five particular specials, plus a documentary, um, which is six hours on the history from the 16th to the 19th century, and on WABE radio, um, a series called Crossings East, which is the story of Asian American immigrants in this country and, and the uh, impact they've had uh, on the development of America, from what's called pre-America, which I presume means Britain. <laughs> That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> to, to the present day. Thank you. And uh, as always, thank you for uh, your support of the Terry College. Um, we uh, have some, uh, some special visitors with us this morning from uh, the Henley College. We uh, have some guests. There are 13 students uh, visiting uh, from the Executive MBA uh, program at Henley uh, in the UK. Um, this is the sixth year that the Henley Group has visited the Terry College. Um, they're touring, touring Athens and Atlanta as part of their program. Uh, it's a two-week itinerary where they come and uh, do some executive MBA things with the Terry College. But uh, if y'all would uh, stand, we appreciate y'all being here this morning. Um, just a quick note, we have uh, some upcoming speakers um, on May 18th, Horace Newcomb. He's the uh, director of the Peabody Awards. He'll be our guest. Um, Professor Newcomb uh, will be presenting at the 65th Annual Peabody Awards for Excellence in Electronic Media. And uh, that awards banquet is on June 5th at the Waldorf Astoria. And then June 15th, uh, we have A.J. Robinson with Central Atlanta Progress. Um, and A.J. will uh, be speaking, as you could guess, about uh, uh, a more livable and vibrant downtown Atlanta community. Um, one more uh, announcement, the uh, Alumni Awards Banquet uh, will be held May 17th, uh, and that will be here in the Executive Education Center, um, which is different from years past, uh, and it'll actually be a dinner. And uh, there is still time to register. Jill, back here in the corner, um, will uh, take your registrations if you haven't done so uh, yet. Let me uh, move on to introducing our speaker this morning, uh, Dave Stockert. Dave uh, became CEO of Post Properties in July of 2002. Uh, prior to uh, Post, Dave was a senior vice president and CFO of Weeks Corporation. Uh, he played a central role in the uh, 1999 merger uh, with Duke Realty. He's a graduate of the University of Colorado in Columbia University, and we're pleased to have him here this morning to speak about uh, the state of the real estate in Atlanta, and if I could just remind you in the Q&A session, if you could make sure you get a microphone for your question, that would uh, be great, greatly helpful. Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you, uh, University of Georgia and, and the Business Chronicle and, and NPR, who I'm a big fan of, uh, for having me here. This is a great... Uh, it's a great event. This is the first time I've been to one of the Terry Third Thursdays, and uh, I'll make sure I come again uh, as a guest. I hope I'll be invited uh, as a guest. I want to talk a little bit about 
the real estate business. It says the state of real estate. That's kind of a pretentious title. This is just my opinion. I'm going to give you some some observations about what I see uh, going on in the real estate business uh, that's very exciting in my mind, and it's changing the way we do business, just like a lot of businesses are being changed these days. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Before I do so, I want to give you a little bit of a of an overview. I think a lot of people here, I hope, are familiar with Post Properties. Maybe some of you have lived with us or you are currently living with us. And, and if you have or you are, I appreciate that and I hope we're taking care of you. But uh, Post today is about 22,000 residential units in 10 cities. We've got about 60 properties and we serve uh, north of 30,000 customers who live with us. Uh, we've got about $3 billion in total asset value, and we have about 800 associates. About uh, five of, 500 of those are here in Metro Atlanta. We've been in business for almost going on 35 years. And as I think everybody knows, uh, the business was created by a man named John Williams who saw an opportunity in the multifamily business to take a very fragmented business that was largely a mom-and-pop type of business. Uh, it, was, it was dominated by merchant builder type orientation. And he saw an opportunity with what was happening demographically with women coming into the workforce, changes that were happening in society to take a business and turn it on its head and recreate the business. And he did that around some, some great ideas of service and curb appeal and landscaping and resort style amenities and security. And he also did something that no one else had really done. And people still to this day haven't done as well, I think, as, as we have. And that's he, he branded the business. So Post, for its entire 30 plus year history, has operated as a branded business. And every property that we've ever had uh, has been a Post Properties. And that was a unique thing. And it's, it's, it's created for us over time. Uh, some powerful advantages, and, and I'm, of course, the beneficiary of that, and I'm grateful for that. We have four uh, types of real estate, of, of property, community that we do. Uh, we do traditional garden-style properties, apartment properties principally. Uh, they have surface parking. They have lots of landscaping and, res again, resort-style amenities. Starting in the 1990s, though, as, as demographic changes were happening, as urbanization was happening in a number of the cities where we operate, we started to come in town and do more urban, uh, higher density type properties. We were one of the first uh, players to come into Midtown Atlanta with, with Post Parkside, right on uh, 10th and Piedmont. And that, at the time, was, was kind of a, viewed as a pioneering location. Today, it's, it's Maine and Maine in, in Midtown Atlanta. But, uh, it's a different type of construction. It's a different type of community. It's a structured parking deck and, and uh, a much more high-dense high um, type of community, but one that we think is, is, is very attractive to people and very successful. We've also done high-rise communities and markets where high-rises are, high rises are warranted. We're doing, uh, we're going to do some again here in Atlanta. We've done some, but, but many of our high-rises have been in, in markets like Washington, D.C. and New York City. And then Maybe the most exciting thing to me that we do is, is mixed use, and uh, those are properties that combine residential with other uses, principally retail, but also office. And more and more today, uh, what is being demanded in, in the marketplace is mixed use, both by the customer in terms of the, the living environment that they want to have, but also by uh, the different uh, governments and, and municipalities and zoning authorities and things who are, who are making real strides in trying to make uh, these urban locations much, much more livable. As I said, we operate a branded strategy. Our apartments, our post-apartment homes, and our condominium and townhome business is, is run through something called post-preferred homes. We think about our business, we, we have four principal constituencies that we have to make happy at the same time, and that's, that's my job. Um, certainly our customers, and we want to be known for quality communities and, and high customer service. Our employees, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that they are happy and motivated and excited about what we do, because if they're excited, they get excited about delivering 
uh, better service to our customers. We want to be a good. We want to be a good part of our communities. We want to be uh, viewed by the, the the people, not just our customers. But when we go into a community and we put up one of our apartment assets, we want it to be viewed as having been additive to that neighborhood. So we want to be part of creating better uh, neighborhoods. And then finally, we also want to create value for our investors, for our shareholders and our bondholders and our lenders and, and others. So uh, that's what we want to be about. That's what we strive to do every day. This is a, an array of our cities where we operate. Uh, Atlanta, of course, is our headquarters. It's our home where we got our start. It's our biggest market uh, by far. Uh, about 45% of what we have is in Atlanta. But we are also very, very focused on the major growth markets in the Sun Belt. We believe in the whole, in, in a kind of simple idea that get into cities that have a lot of economic prosperity, population growth, job growth, get in the way of that growth and you'll do well in real estate. And so we stake out positions in cities that are among the top uh, 15 or 20 in population growth, in economic growth, uh, in in-migration, both domestically and internationally. We're gonna, put our, we're gonna put our properties in places that grow. Um, you may be familiar with some of the things we have in Atlanta, around Atlanta, but I wanted to, to take a minute and just show you some of the, the properties that we have around the the country to, just to give you a flavor for what we do. Starting out in, in Dallas, Texas, this is at Addison Circle. This is up the Dallas Tollway. It'd be sort of the equivalent of, uh, of Georgia 400, going up Georgia 400 a little ways. Dallas and Atlanta are very similar cities in terms of the way they're laid out, the transportation infrastructure, the way they've grown uh, to the north, where the business has gone. But this would be up the equivalent of, of Georgia 400. Addison Circle, it's a it's a mixed-use community that we developed in the 1990s that is a fantastic, walkable uh, community that involves not only 1,300 or so apartment uh, units, but also about 100,000 square feet of service retail, principally restaurants and, and other retailers that provide services to the, to the customers. And then we've got a 40,000 square foot office building at Addison Circle that also serves as our as our Dallas headquarters, um, in addition to serving some other office users out there. But that's in, in Dallas, Texas. In, in Charlotte, uh, this is our gateway project, and it's right across the street from the, the Gateway uh, Bank America facility that Cousins did. Uh, this is in Uptown Charlotte. Downtown Charlotte is called Uptown, and uh, this is in Uptown. Charlotte's done a fantastic job. Of, of, of making their downtown or their uptown uh, a vibrant and, and exciting place to be. Uh, we're part of that. Again, this is a, this is a community that, that combines apartment units, over 400 apartment units, and about 13,000 square feet of, of retail that rings the street. And as you can see, the building is oriented to be uh, on the street with to be accessible and exciting to pedestrians. So it's not it's not set back and gated. It's it's really tried to tries to be part of the uh, part of the streetscape. Uh, in Washington D.C., Greater Washington D.C., this is actually out in, in Arlington, Virginia, uh, right uh, within um, a short walk of the Pentagon. If you could walk there, it's the, you you wouldn't get past the security. But uh, this is post Pentagon Row. We did this in a joint venture with another real estate investment trust in the retail business. Federal Realty, and what this is is essentially an open-air mall of 300,000 square feet or so of retail, and then we've put 500 residential units on top. Very exciting and dynamic environment. In New York, right around 9-11 uh, in, in, in uh, June of 2001, we, we started construction on Post Luminaria. It's on 23rd and 1st Avenue on the east side of Manhattan. Uh, we had also had uh, proposed another high-rise on the Upper East Side at 89th. We started that in November of 2001, so in the aftermath of 9-11, of we were committed to, to New York and to that marketplace, felt like it was going to be resilient, and it has turned out to be that way. Uh, and we've had good success with, with high-rise in uh, Manhattan. Again, in Dallas, Texas, there's a there's a neighborhood in Dallas, Uptown Dallas, which is the equivalent of Midtown Atlanta, has grown much the same way. 
Uh, it's, it started out as being kind of a blighted area, but people started coming in, including Post, developed a lot of residential, and now it is kind of the ground zero for where the young urban professionals want to live. This is a loft community that we built in uh, uptown Dallas. All those windows that you see face the downtown skyline, but it's, it's very proximate to downtown. And we are converting that as we speak to a condominium uh, community. We've, we started it last year, and I think we've got six or seven units left to sell, but it's been a very successful uh, conversion. In Houston, Texas, uh, this is an historic renovation that we did of the of the Rice Hotel. The Rice Hotel is a is a historic hotel in in downtown Houston. At one time, it served as the state capital of Texas. It was the the last place that John Kennedy spent the night before he went on to Dallas. Um, and uh, several years ago, we we did an historic renovation and converted the hotel into a loft uh, apartment community with about 300 units and then street level retail. Uh, that's again right in downtown and downtown Houston just like Atlanta and Tampa and Charlotte and Dallas and Orlando and every market that we're in is is making great strides at making their downtown uh, a livable place. Some of you are familiar with Post River, Riverside. I hope if, if you're not you'll come over sometime. Uh, we're off of 75 and Northside uh, Parkway, Mount Perrin exit and there's a great restaurant there, the River Room, but, but this is our headquarters location, Riverside is about 500 uh, rental apartments. It was built around a town square with service level retail, restaurant, deli, bank, shoe shine parlor, uh, uh, dry cleaner, and a dentist, and, and all the things that you would want as part of a little town square. It's been very successful. The thing that, that I look at when we do these mixed uses is how the retail tenants do. And at Riverside, we've had the same retail tenants in there for the, for the entire six or, or so years. Well, actually, it's about eight years that it's been open. Uh, and that's testament to the, um, to the way the whole community works together. We also have 200,000 square feet of office space in our headquarters at, at Post Riverside. I want to show you a couple of, and this is not the best rendering, but um, a couple of things that we're working on in Atlanta. Um, there's, there's more architectural interest to this building that's, than is, is depicted on this, on this rendering. But just very near where we are today, uh, north of the Buckhead Loop, if you were to go out, take the Buckhead Loop, turn right on Phipps, and then left on Alexander, you would find that we're clearing land for what we're currently calling Post Alexander. And it will be 307 rental units. We will be uh, commencing construction here shortly. And the idea here is going to be to create what will be essentially our flagship rental community in Atlanta. Uh, it'll have, uh, one of the things that's happened in the last few years is that, with, particularly with the condo phenomenon, it's, it's really raised the bar on residential uh, communities. And so this will have condo level finishes, it'll have condo style amenities with, with wonderful courtyards and pool amenities and, and club rooms and fitness centers. And, and this will be, uh, I believe, about the nicest rental community uh, in Metro Atlanta. And then also in this neighborhood at Peachtree and Peachtree Dunwoody, uh, right next to the church, uh, we are in a consortium that is developing this mixed-use uh, property, which we have not yet named, uh, but it's at 3630 Peachtree. It will, con it will comprise two towers. The uh, North Tower, which is the smaller tower, is 100% condominium units that uh, will be kind of entry level price point, which today in Atlanta is probably $300 a square foot. And then in the taller building, uh, we'll, we'll, we're doing a, a mixed use where the first 18 floors are office, uh, owned by uh, Duke and, and Pope and Land. And then there's an amenity level where the building, you see where the building kind of steps back with a pool and a fitness center and a great club room and a gourmet catering kitchen, guest suites, and then you've got luxury higher-end condominiums uh, that top that office building in a great location that's walkable to, to Phipps and Lennox and the retail across the street on Peachtree, but also is, is accessible to Brookhaven. It's, it'll be the, really the last big commercial building 
bordering on, on Brookhaven. And so if you're a runner, if you want to go out and walk, uh, you'll have the advantage of, of being able to do that in a, in a wonderful, serene, uh, peaceful sort of neighborhood. So that's a, a couple of the things that we're working on. We're working on other things in other markets, but I wanted to show you those two, those two communities in Atlanta. I want to talk about five things that, that I see happening in the business that I think are exciting. Uh, this is, there, there, are, there are a lot of people in the real estate business in here. You may have other ideas, but, but from my vantage point in a public company in particular, I want to talk about some of the things that we see happening in the business. And that is that the business, the real estate business, continues to consolidate and companies are getting much, much larger, more sophisticated. There's tremendous liquidity in this business, a lot of capital flowing into this business. There's great information, transparency about the business today uh, that wasn't maybe the case as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. Globalization, which is affecting a lot of businesses, is, is, is starting to, to play a role in the real estate business. Technology, which is affecting business, is, is having an effect on, on our business today and then our products uh, really across all the different property types, our products are evolving as, as the cities are evolving. Uh, in terms of consolidation, there are some enormous real estate companies today, much more so than there ever have been in the past. When most of the companies like Post went public, in, and it started in the mid, early mid-1990s, uh, to be a billion-dollar company was, was big, and most of the companies were several hundred million dollars. Today, you've got several companies that are $20 billion, and you've got a few companies closing in on $40, $50 billion, and we're probably heading to companies that are much bigger than that. Uh, there are advantages to this, but it crosses all the different product types in the residential business, equity residentials, $20 billion. You've got industrial companies that are uh, tens of billions of dollars. You've got office companies, and you've got, you've got retail companies that are very, very large. Even though these companies have grown the way they have, uh, none of these companies has more than about, with the exception maybe of the, of the mall guys, General Growth and Simon, if you look at office, industrial, residential, no one's got a market share that's more than 5%. So there's still tremendous opportunity in this capital intense business to, uh, for companies to consolidate and get, get larger. One of the reasons, one of the things that drives that consolidation is the fact that we are, we're a very capital intense business and as you get larger you have, you have greater access to less expensive capital and uh, businesses are starting, real estate companies now are starting to access all sorts of sophisticated capital markets that we didn't have access to in the past including derivatives markets and, and preferreds and convertible stock markets and, and all kinds of bond and CMBS markets, but it gives us a, an advantage in our cost of capital to be to be larger. The other thing, and maybe the more interesting thing to me, and it's less this is less of an of a possibility in the residential business, but if you think about the retail business and you think about say Walmart and the way Walmart is able to uh, extract value by being large. Uh, with their suppliers, you know, some, some of the retail companies as they've become larger and they control more of the, of the high quality real estate in the U.S. and increasingly around the world, they're able to counterbalance some of these large retailers and change the balance of the, of the negotiating position through their size. Um, in our business, there's not so much of an opportunity to leverage residential relationships because most of us only live at one place at a time. But if you think about the industrial business and the distribution and logistics business, um, that's another opportunity where if I'm, a, if I'm a company that increasingly needs to be global, to have a provider like a Prologis who can go with me around the world, who can have and manage my distribution facilities, whether it's in Asia or Latin America or Europe or the U.S., that's an advantage. And, and large companies are playing that out, and I think that will continue to, uh, to happen. So I think the trend is going to... Um, the trend will continue. The other thing that's come with, um, and this has come with size hand in hand, and one of the reasons we've been allowed to get bigger is because the transparency of our business, the, the quality of the information about our businesses is so much better than it has been uh, as recently as a decade ago. And we are now, and maybe the reason that there are people here listening today is because either you're interested in REITs 
or you're interested in buying a condo. That, those are the two, uh, the, the two things that seem to be on everybody's mind about the real estate business today. But real estate is, is rapidly becoming a, a very uh, widely recognized mainstream investment category for uh, not just private investors who buy individual assets, but also investors who buy uh, securitized interests in those assets. There are now a bunch of companies, seven or eight companies, in the S&P 500 that are part of that. And they're part of the S&P 500 index, and that's, that's a recent phenomenon. That happened about three or four years ago. One of the important things that, that comes with that is that now that your REITs are part of the index, uh, a lot of money managers are benchmarked. Their performance is benchmarked against the S&P 500. So if there are REITs in the S&P 500, then a lot of those money managers need to own, need to have exposure to REITs if they, wanna, if they don't want to worry about being outperformed by the S&P 500 and the REIT uh, part of the S&P 500. So that has drawn a lot of capital into this business. The other thing, though, and the, the, the better part of that is, is we've been a great, REITs have been a great performer. If you look at one year, three year, five year, 10 year, 15 years, uh, REIT total return performance has beat the S&P 500. Um, in the University of Chicago, they did an academic study. They, they showed that, uh, that went back over a lot of, of history and showed that if you added REITs to a portfolio that included both stocks and bonds, uh, as well, that you would you would increase the return and you would decrease the risk. So those of you finance majors who know efficient frontier and all that stuff, uh, that's what that was about. Uh, that is gaining more traction. So we're seeing more and more people uh, coming into REITs. You're seeing. Uh, uh, you're seeing these exchange-traded funds now that are available on the New York Stock Exchange that focus on REITs. A lot of different avenues now to invest in REITs and in securitized uh, real estate. With all that, you know, we've had to disclose a lot more information about our business today. Most of the public companies are disclosing a tremendous amount of detailed property-level information regularly, quarterly. Uh, there are many people who are studying real estate um, on a more macro basis and, and publishing that information. The bottom line is there is much better information about the business today than there ever has been in the past. And one of the things that that, that is, is doing is, at least a lot of people believe it's doing, is it's taking a little bit of the cyclicality out of the, out of the real estate business because supply and demand is, is better measured today than it, than it ever has been in the past. It's, we're, we're still a cyclical business. The lead times on creating assets are still long enough that you get into overbuilt situations and then undersupplied situations, but, but the, the, uh, the swings in the cycle are, are being dampened. And as a result, the, um, the prices for real estate assets, because they're viewed as somewhat less risky on a relative basis than they were 10 or 15 years ago, the prices have been bid up and the yield expectation that someone has on a real estate asset compared to, say, a 10-year treasury, that's compressed to levels that we've, we've never seen. And some people think it's cyclical and related to low interest rates, but I think it has more to do with, with the, a change in the perception of risk in, in real estate. Uh, globalization is, is something that affects everybody. Um, or many businesses today, it, it's something that is, is impacting us in different ways in the real estate business. Uh, one way it's impacting us is, is uh, you're starting to see securitized real estate markets that are being created in other countries that are along the lines of the U.S. Uh, real estate market, the REIT market, there are new REIT markets in Japan, in Europe. Public companies in the U.S. now, as, as you have these markets overseas, uh, companies in the U.S. are finding that they can sometimes raise money at more attractive rates if they do it in these in these other countries. And so a lot of companies recently have, have been raising money in Australian public capital markets because Australians uh, who save a lot of money and are willing to accept a low current return are willing to pay more for real estate assets than U.S. investors are willing to pay. And so sophisticated companies are arbitraging that opportunity. Uh, the other thing is that um, companies are going global along with their customers. Again, not so much in the residential business, but in the, in the distribution business in particular, a couple of companies, Prologis, 
which was Security Capital Industrial, and another company called AMB, are, are pretty aggressively going around the world with their with their customers to help them with their logistics and their distribution needs. And then on the retail front, as you know, you're starting to hear with all the with the, with the Chinese. Uh, president, I guess, over here in, in Seattle and talking about Starbucks and other things going to China, you're seeing some retail uh, real estate companies going to look to expand in, internationally with, the, with their customers. And then, of course, uh, large institutional investors who had been uh, much more focused on U.S. investment are, are going overseas. The, the bottom line of all that is it makes the whole business a lot more fluid and a lot more uh, liquid. As we become bigger, as we become more liquid, as we be become more transparent, um, we're all investing more in sophisticated systems to run our business. Real estate historically was pretty entrepreneurial. A lot of, of companies where the founder's name has been on the door and it was a family business, uh, that's, that's changing rapidly. We're now much more sophisticated businesses with all sorts of management development systems like you that like you read about when you read about companies like General Electric, and I'm not saying we're there yet, but, but the industry is, is rapidly moving toward much more sophisticated operational platforms. Technology, all of us are making big investments in technology, and we see it benefiting our business in not only the information that we're able to, to get real time about our business, but customer relationship databases in, in our business in particular, uh, we see a big opportunity in marketing over the Internet. So many of our customers are young, uh, single professionals. They all carry Blackberries. They all carry, uh, you know, trios and cell phones and things, and they want to shop over the Internet, and we've got to give them that opportunity to, to shop over the Internet for an apartment and to do it at whatever time of day that they want to do it. So we've got, a, we've got a call center today in Greenville, South Carolina, and it handles our 24-7 Internet leads and, and rollover phone calls and things like that. It helps us. Uh, attract more traffic and is making our business more efficient. And then, of course, we're all doing uh, centralized procurement, Internet proc procurement. Our maintenance guys on site, if they need parts, they go onto a system. They, they click on a, a menu. We've got a national contract with whoever the supplier is. It may be Home Depot or someone else, and the parts are delivered to, to, the, um, to the community. It makes us more efficient. It, it reduces the inventory of what we have on site. Uh, and it certainly allows us to track it uh, better than we could have in the past. As a result, companies that have this technology, have these platforms, we think are going to be better operators than those who don't. And so when we, we're we starting to see some opportunities now where we can buy, if we can buy a, a community that's been run by a, a smaller group that hasn't had access to all that, we oftentimes can pretty dramatically improve the performance of, of, that, of that community. For those of you who are, who are interested in the business and young and, and thinking about it, th there are many avenues now in the real estate business, many different ways to, to get involved. We all, again, have very sophisticated uh, platforms and, and all sorts of fun functions that we might not have had in the past, treasury functions and risk management functions and operational functions and HR functions and, and things that uh, public relations functions and marketing functions that, that – um, you know, we, we, we've arrived, I think, as an industry. Um, and I've talked about career development and that sort of thing. Last thing I want to talk about um, is, again, the product evolution. This is affecting every major uh, real estate category. For us, and, and we, we love this part of it, but um, every city, every major city uh, that we operate in it's got, has, got, has got the same set of issues. Uh, there's not a lot of money federally or at state levels or local levels to expand the infrastructure. These cities are attracting tremendous population growth, job growth, economic vi vitality, and we're just we're simply outstripping the, the water infrastructure, the, the road infrastructure, the air quality infrastructure uh, and issues. And so as a result, we're all having all these cities are, are making a big effort to urbanize and to urbanize around the existing infrastructure uh, that exists. And as a result, it's, it's starting to move us closer to uh, environments where things like mass transportation are more efficient, which is a good thing. But it's also 
creating these really dynamic urban neighborhoods that didn't, exa didn't exist in, in a lot of these cities as recently as, as 10 or 15 years ago. 15 years ago, the, you know, the city of Atlanta was still losing population, and that has reversed now. And I think the trend for the next 25 years is that you know, the, the urban core of Atlanta will continue to, to attract population. When you look at the, at the demographics over the next 10 or 15 years, the big, the big growth pockets, the big growth portions of the, of the demographics are the baby boomers, of course, and this echo boomer, the children of the baby boom, um, who are this, the young co cohort that's, that's 19 years old. They're starting to graduate from college. Both of, we think both of those demographic pockets are going to be really um, enticed uh, into living in more urban locations. And as a result, you know, you're seeing the explosion of condominium activity and and urban um, residential development and mixed-use development. And that is a trend that, that, that all the cities wanted to encourage, but no one's had to really legislate. It's happening, it's happening because market forces are demanding it. It's happening because uh, people want to live in Midtown Atlanta. You know, no one is legislating it. It's just that it's becoming an exciting place. People want to live in Buckhead. Uh, they want to live in an environment like this, particularly when they see all the dynamic changes that are that are happening. And increasingly, people are going to want to live back in, in downtown Atlanta. We've got another piece of land. We don't have renderings to show you yet, but uh, we've got another uh, couple of parcels down at, at Allen Plaza and was down there yesterday. And that's going to be when the world of Coca-Cola opens and, and Allen Plaza continues to develop and all the things that are happening down there, downtown is going to be a, a vibrant uh, place to live. One of the things that's had to happen, though, is that almost everything you do now has to have some mixed-use component. People want to see, uh, they want to see uh, retail on the ground floor. They want, they want development that is accessible to pedestrians, that encourages a neighborhood feel, uh, and that, you know, that's been an exciting change in the, in the product evolution today. Um, and then, of course. Uh, people are focused on lifestyle amenities like mass transportation, parks and green space, and streetscapes. And I think green space is something that governments are going to have to go do, but increasingly streetscapes and, and mass transportation are going to come because market forces are going, to, are going to densify these locations to the point where some of that stuff starts to make sense. Um, Globalization, again, not, not affecting our business quite as much, but, but certainly if you talk to people in the office business, uh, globalization is something that will continue to affect that business. It's changing uh, hoteling concepts and things, uh, the way people work in office space it continues to, evo to evolve, uh, and that creates opportunities and challenges for the office business in the, um, in the distribution warehouse business. Again, globalization, inventory management, systems, um, internet transactions are affecting that business, the speed at which goods move through our economy. Uh, and then in the retail business, you know, the, just the, the, the power of, of a company like Walmart has obviously changed retail development to some degree. Um, and the internet transactions are, are for retail are continuing to increase. So all, all of the, whatever part of real estate you operate in, whether it's office or retail or industrial or residential, uh, there are, are all kinds of forces uh, changing the business. The bottom line, though, is it's a the fundamentals of our business are good. The economy is good, and it's a very exciting with these changes. A very exciting time to be operating in this business. So I'm delighted again to have had the opportunity to be here, and um, if there are any questions, I'd I'd be happy to take them. Yes. Do you have any sense for uh, how much the percentage of commercial real estate in this country has now evolved to the point where it's owned by REITs as opposed to private? And uh, why is why are institutions still putting so much money aside that's going into non-REIT investments as opposed to just going ahead and investing directly in REITs? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
the uh, the statistics that you hear on the commercial side, it's it's a pretty small percentage still today that's owned by REITs, you know, 15 percent or less, depending on how you define, you know, commercial real estate. And it's true that it it has sort of ebbed and flowed. Um, a lot of people would have thought, even though companies have gotten to be 30, 40 billion, then they might even have been bigger today than they are. And certainly, I have an expectation. I think other people do that there's no reason that there won't be $100 billion real estate companies, and, and eventually there ought to be some diversified real estate companies. Today, we still pretty much, each company focuses on one aspect of real estate, whether it's residential or commercial or retail. Or, and I think you're going to see more crossover down, down track. Institutions, though, continue to want to own it directly, and part of that is because even though REITs have been as a, as a stock, have, have had great performance, they still have ups and downs. You know, the stock prices still move up, up and down. And, and some institutions would just culturally, the way they've, they've developed over time, they've just, they're more accustomed to owning a real estate asset that they can kind of look at and assume has a relatively stable value over some holding period, and they don't have to watch it, you know, go up and down. That's, that's part of it. Part of it is the fact that a lot of institutions have been advised by uh, real estate advisors whose whose interests lie in continuing to invest in real estate, and then and then part of it is because sometimes the public markets don't don't value the companies um, over the long run. I think the public markets do a great job of valuing companies over the short run. Sometimes they don't, and so today, what's happened in the last year and a half, you've had a lot of private companies who look at the the public companies and say they're being undervalued and I'm going to go buy that public company and, and take it private. It happened with Gables, it hap which is a, an apartment company that had a lot of assets here in Atlanta. It's happened uh, with a lot of real estate companies where there's been an arbitrage between what private investors think and what the public market thinks. And so in a good capital market, those, if, if those differences persist, that the gaps ultimately get closed one way or the other. But, but I, think, I think the trend, though, is clearly that there will be more real estate owned in, in bigger companies over time. Yes? You mentioned that uh, you saw a need for electronic commerce, obviously, to bring prospects and as potential customers. What else do you see as offering, uh, I guess, uh, customers after they've gone beyond the prospect stage? Well, yeah, well, certainly um, there, there may be some services that we could provide to our customers, and we're looking at that. Certainly customer communications, and we're still a bit in the dark ages in, in communicating with our, with our residents. And one of the things that I'm anxious to do is get to the point where we're communicating electronically pretty regularly with all of our customers. And things that, they, that may be important to them, like a maintenance request that they can log in electronically and come into a resident portal uh, if they've got something that, um, you know, they've got a drippy faucet that they notice at 10 o'clock at night. You know, I would like for them to feel like they ha they have an, a, an opportunity to come in and log in that request and then it could get dealt with uh, in a in a more real-time way. One of the one of the concerns that our customers have, we, we survey our customers all the time, and they would like us to have longer office hours. Uh, you know, which is we would love to do, but it, you know, that, it's a staffing issue that would be we'd, we'd have to add, add a lot to the cost structure. I believe that not that what they don't they don't really want to see a person sitting in the office at, at nine o'clock at night, but they do want to be able to communicate with posts at nine o'clock at night. And so, to me, that's one of the biggest things. I think the prospecting and the marketing is huge to get internet leases and applications and go through the. You know, we can do the whole resident qualification, do the background check, the, the credit check. All that can be done uh, electronically. And then the other, the other big thing is can we give our customers a sense that they've got a 24-7 opportunity to communicate with us however they want to do it. Well, the thing that our retail, our retailers, the retailers who are our tenants, the thing that they want the most from us is uh, they want us to help them drive traffic 
to their stores, to their retail outlets. And so again, if we can offer over our internet marketing and things, if we can if we can push marketing marketing of our retail tenants to our residential customers and beyond that, you know, that would be very valuable to them. That's the thing that they would they would like most in addition to plenty of parking and, you know, all the other things that that are sort of the basics. Yeah. As you mentioned, the uh, term urbanization and as it relates to retail and especially the Peachtree Corridor, I cannot think of a couple block stretch from Brookhaven to downtown where you truly can have that urbanized retail walking experience. And I know Mayor Franklin is making a big push with advisory group of developers to figure out how do we make the Peachtree Corridor truly a great street like some of the other big cities do. So I'd love in your opinion, you know, what do we have to do to make Peachtree the great corridor as it relates from five points all the way down to Brookhaven as a corridor, but then individually because Buckhead, Midtown, Downtown each have their own personalities and it's a distinct difference in the makeup of the residents who live in that area and what to do in each of those sub areas. Yeah. Um, well, you're not going to get you're not going to get there overnight for sure because there are some structural issues with sections of Peachtree that are going to be harder to solve. But in in Buckhead, we're about to start the new Peachtree Road improvements just right out here um, that uh, are going to change the character of Peachtree, make it a lot more uh, hospitable to pedestrians in this location, a little less intimidating today. It's it's you know five or six lanes of traffic to to try and cross the street. Um, that's moving pretty fast, but we're going to add uh, streetscape beautification and, and medians and things like that that are going to help. The Buckhead Village is uh, going to under, I think it's going to undergo a, um, a transformation from being kind of a bar area to being more of what you're talking about. And that's certainly, I think that location's an opportunity to create that. And we, when you see the, the residential that's being built across the street and the new St. Regis Hotel project and the condominiums on top of that, and you combine that with the redevelopment of the Buckhead Village, I mean, you could definitely have kind of walkable uh, environment. I think what we're doing at uh, Peachtree and Peachtree Dunwoody with the retail that's across the street and Phipps Plaza will start to do that, and we'll obviously make the street kind of experience uh, a big part of that. In, um, in Midtown, when you drive Peachtree South, from uh, you know North Avenue or so down to uh, or for really from from say 17th Street all the way uh, south, and you see what's happening at say 14th Street and Peachtree with the new King and Spalding building, and when the Symphony Hall gets built uh, in that location, I think that'll that's making that environment really dynamic. You got the Jocks and Jill site, which will be more mixed use. I think Mid Midtown will increasingly become um, that mix of, of office and residential and walkability and and retail and then and then down in um, again I think that um, in downtown where with with what is possible at Allen Plaza and Jim Borders deal right there at the Marta station uh, and what we're going to do in the world of Coke you know you're going to start to create an environment a neighborhood around there that I think will will change um, will 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 start to to bring that to downtown, and then what what Egbert Perry is doing on on the the other end, and um, his redevelopments on on Auburn Avenue. There, there's a tremendous amount that I think there there are, there are some stretches that are going to be tough, but uh, I think there's a tre tremendous opportunity. And if we can get the um, if we can get the Peachtree Streetcar as part of this, which I think there's some possibility that we can get, really get that done. I think uh, I think we can transform. Peachtree Street. It'll take some time, but but the change that's occurred in the last ten years, in my mind, has been has been staggering. I was delighted this morning to to read that the uh, Fulton County Commission is going to sell the the Bellwood Quarry, uh, so the Beltline can get it, kind of the crown jewel of of the Beltline. Um, I think it'll happen. Do you have any suggestions for future business graduates as to what type of things they should plan on studying possibly different to prepare them for future entry-level positions in the real estate market? 
Well, as I said, I mean, regardless of what your, you know, your background or your or your interest is, there are now more ways, I think, to come into the business than there were in the past. I mean, I think historically, you, you know, real estate traditionally you came in leasing or, uh, you know, on the development side or financial analysis and some of the <laughs> things that were kind of the nuts and bolts. But today, there are marketing opportunities and human resource opportunities, technology opportunities, finance opportunities, accounting, treasury, you know, all sorts of opportunities. So there's nothing, you know, there's no specific thing. If, if you've got a particular passion and, and set of skills, I mean, it, it, it applies today. Um, you know, our business, again, is like, is like every other business. We're confronted with this dramatic pace of change, so certainly having skills in, in technology and, and, you know, being up to, up to speed on all that is very helpful. Um, it's, a more, it's a sophisticated business. Financial concepts and risk management concepts in our business are, uh, I think, are, you know, maybe a little more sophisticated today than, they, than they've been in the past. But uh, there are many, many ways to get into the business. Uh, you addressed uh, multifamily, uh, office, retail, and even industrial. Would you make any observations about the hotel field? I don't know. I don't know enough about that business, Sam, to really have a. But but you know, it's some of the same things are are. There are certainly changes. I'm, I'm intrigued by what Jim Borders is doing with his 12 concept, where he's combining uh, the condominium and the hotel at Atlantic Station, and also at uh, there at uh, next to Allen Plaza, he's doing the same sort of thing, and, and the idea will be um, to leverage the services of the hotel, and by doing so, he's able to create more of a boutique hotel concept that you wouldn't otherwise probably be able to to justify. But um, you know, again, the hotel business in 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 places like Atlanta will be governed. The growth of that business will be grow, governed by the economic vitality of the, of the city, and and on that score, I'm very encouraged, just with with everything that's happening in this in this city and the expansion of our convention business. Hopefully, it's not just you know a Katrina related thing, but but more and more reflects the fact that Atlanta is becoming a much more attractive destination to be part of. But you know, we're looking at. Um, you're going to see a lot more mixed-use hotel projects, I think, where the hotel is one component, uh, and you're seeing a fair amount of synergy between, particularly between condominiums and hotels. And you may also, you know, you, I don't know why you couldn't put a hotel on top of an office building and some things like that. So uh, I think the same forces are at work. Can you speak a little bit towards uh, occupancy rates and also rental rates. I know three or four years ago, it was kind of brutal for some apartment owners, but it was great for homeowners and developers. And where are we kind of on that cycle now? Yeah, we, our business, I mean, it was very tough business in the early 2000s. We had a few things working that came together at the same time. One is that in many of the markets where we operate, you know, the country was coming off of this incredible growth trajectory. Atlanta was making all these jobs. Dallas was making all these jobs. A lot of these jobs were, were technology marketing related and, and back office and, and technical positions, and they, were, uh, and they were telecom related jobs. A big percentage were in, those, uh, were in those categories, and those businesses obviously got hurt badly, and that hurt us. Uh, at the same time, you know, we were sort of, we were all building product thinking that the late 90s was the way it was going to be forever. And uh, so we were overbuilt th probably through about 2003. And then, and then the, the other thing was all of a sudden interest rates went down rapidly. And even though home prices continue to go up, the, the, the monthly P&I, the principal and interest on buying a house, all of a sudden became, you know, it was when interest rates go from, Seven percent to five percent—it's it's a huge difference in your monthly outlay, which is how most of our customers think about their housing costs. They think about how much am I spending per month, and all of a sudden, you know, everybody could buy a home or a condo. So we had—it was a very tough time in the business. Supply though has contracted a lot. Growth is back. Uh, you know, the the economic 
uh, or the job growth in Atlanta. I was delighted to see the, the numbers get recast because no one could figure out how we were absorbing all this housing in Atlanta and not creating any jobs. It turns out, you know, we have been creating jobs. So where we sit today in the residential business is that occupancies are up pretty sharply everywhere and that rents are up pretty pretty reasonably everywhere. On For post, and we look at our rents every week, we're up about 5% on average year over year on lease transactions, whether it's new leases or renewals. And I expect that to continue and, and probably to accelerate. And I think we're in a window now where we've got at least 06, 07, and 08, where if we have a decent U.S. economy, I think our business is going to be very, very good because the supply is is very constrained today. There's not much there's not much new product coming on. Certainly, rental product. There continues to be some condominium product, but even that is starting to slow down. So I think the supply and demand looks good, and um, economic uh, growth looks good, and population household formation in all of our cities looks very good. So I'm 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 pretty optimistic. What I observe with the other product types like office and, and retail and, and others is that everybody feels pretty good. Office is starting to feel better. It's still it's not where you know anyone would really like it to be, but it's certainly moving in the right direction. And I think, again, office guys feel like the next couple of years could be pretty good. One more? Okay, one more. Or not. Well, thank you very much. up here we've got a couple things um we've got a nice uh, piece of crystal here that oh, we want right. to take uh, want you to take back to your office and then right down here that's great we uh have our our terry third thursday uh paint can and fantastic as everyone here knows this is really not paint there's a a, a terry third thursday golf t-shirt in, or a shirt in here and only speakers of terry third thursdays have them so we uh, hope you'll wear that with pride, and again, we I appreciate will. you uh, coming and speaking to us here this morning. I will. Although I went to the University of Colorado, all my kids are, are Georgia fans, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.